Hello and welcome back. Today we will have lecture 5-1 on Fourier transform. The objectives of today's lecture are to use the Fourier series to define the Fourier transform and to find the Fourier transform of a given signal. The Fourier series approach is somewhat limited to the use of only harmonically related complex exponentials as basic signals and it can only be used to represent periodic signals. We can extend this method to include non-periodic signals by using Fourier transforms. The Fourier transform applies to energy signals. We can also apply the Fourier transforms to periodic power signals. Recall that energy signals are ones where the energy is between zero and less than infinity, and that power signals are ones where the power is absolutely between zero and infinity. Suppose x of t is a periodic-like signal. So I'm going to define x of t to be the following arbitrary time-limited signal, where it's time-limited between negative t over 2 and positive t over 2. So time-limited being defined as something that does not go on to negative and positive infinity, or x of t is equal to 0 for the absolute value of t greater than t over 2. So let us define xp of t as a periodic represent, repetition of x of t. So xp of t would look like the following. Where it would then go on either direction. Where this would be 0. Here's the copy at t naught and the copy at negative t naught. So what we see here is that as t naught goes to infinity, xp of t approaches x of t. And if we're thinking about Fourier series, xp of k would approach x of k, where x of k is the spectrum of x of t. Since xp of t is a periodic signal, we can write it by using Fourier series. So xp of t is the summation from k equals negative infinity to infinity, xp of k e to the j k omega naught t, where omega naught is 2 pi over t naught, and we know that xp of k is the Fourier series coefficient formula, 1 over t naught, the integral over 1 period t naught, xp of t, e to the negative j k omega naught t dt. Since we have a time-limited signal, when t is between negative t naught over 2 to t naught over 2, we see that xp of t equals x of t, so we can rewrite the Fourier series coefficient xp of k equal to the integral from 1 to, over t naught, from negative t naught over 2 to t naught over 2, x of t e to the negative j k omega naught t dt. Since x of t is equal to 0 for the absolute value of t greater than t naught over 2, we can then extend the limits of integration to infinity, and x p of k would be equal to 1 over t naught, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the negative j k omega naught t dt, which we know is equal to x of k, the spectrum for x of t. So now, by multiplying both sides of this equation by t naught, we have that t naught xp of k is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity x of t e to the negative j k omega naught t dt, which we also now know is t naught x of k. And we will show that this is equal to x of j k omega naught, which are samples of x of j omega. So consider what happens to t naught x of k as t naught increases. So let's say we have a small t naught and a large omega naught. So here, we're going to have an envelope that looks like a sink squared. And we're going to plot t naught x of k which equals x of j k omega naught. So if omega naught is large, I'll have one at zero. This will be omega naught. This will be negative omega naught. And we'll call the zero point two omega naught, negative two omega naught. And then we'll have a point over here somewhere that's three omega naught and negative three omega naught and so on. So what if we have a large t naught? 
That means we're going to have a small omega knot. So once again, I make the envelope, which is going to be a sink squared. And now I'm going to have many samples between this zero crossing and this zero crossing, where this is now omega naught, two omega naught, three omega naught, and so on, and on that side. So what you can see here is that with the large T naught and the small omega naught, they are starting to converge more on plotting out X of JK omega naught. So this is also T naught X of K, X of JK omega naught. So if we define x of j omega to be x of j omega equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the minus j omega t dt, the first thing you should notice that it looks very similar to the frequency response integral that we defined before, where we had h of j omega was the integral from minus infinity to infinity, h of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And what you're going to find is that that frequency response is really the Fourier transform of the impulse response, we see that T naught XP of K consists of samples of X of J omega every omega naught radian per second. That is T naught XP of K equals X of JK omega naught. Note that X of J omega is the envelope of T naught XP of K and the set of Fourier series coefficients approaches the envelope as T naught goes to infinity. And this illustrates the basic idea behind the Fourier analysis of aperiodic signals. Think of an aperiodic signal as the limit of a periodic signal as the period becomes very large. And we can examine the limiting behavior of the Fourier series representation for the signal, which gets us the Fourier transform. Let's use X of JK omega naught in place of T naught X of K in the Fourier series for XP of T. So XP of T equals the summation from k equals negative infinity to infinity, xp of k e to the jk omega naught t, which becomes the summation from k equals negative infinity to infinity, x of jk omega naught over t naught e to jk omega naught t, which can be written as the summation from k equals negative infinity to infinity, x of jk omega naught e to the jk omega naught t, omega naught over two pi, because one over t naught is the same as omega naught over two pi. So as T naught goes to infinity or omega naught goes to zero, we've already shown that XP of T approaches X of T. So if we sketch out an envelope here where the horizontal axis is omega and we have a signal here with an envelope X of J omega, X of J omega, E J omega T. We'll put harmonics on this axis. So if this is zero, this one would be K omega naught, and this one would be K plus one omega naught. So we're taking samples of our signal. So here would be our first sample, and then here would be our next sample, and our next sample, and so on. Then we know that the value here is x of jk omega naught times e to the jk omega naught. And for the sample here, it would be x of j k plus one omega naught times e to the j k plus one omega naught. So then what if we needed to find the area for this rectangle? The area for that rectangle would be X of JK omega naught times E to the JK omega naught times omega naught. Thinking about this like Riemann sum, which we use to find integrals, where you sum the area under the curve by summing the area of each of these rectangles as the areas get closer and closer together, we would get that as T naught approaches zero or omega naught approaches zero, the series sum converges to an integral. 
So x p of t equals the summation from k equals negative infinity to infinity, x of j k omega naught e to the j k omega naught omega naught over two pi becomes x of t equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity x of j omega e to the j omega t d omega over two pi. We then call x of j omega the Fourier transform of x of t, and we call x of t the inverse Fourier transform of x of j omega. So x of j omega equals the Fourier transform of x of t is the integral from minus infinity to infinity x of t e to the minus j omega t dt, and x of t equals the inverse Fourier transform of x of j omega, or the integral from minus infinity to infinity x of j omega e to the j omega t d omega over two pi or the one over two pi, the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of j omega, e to the j omega t, d omega. In terms of f in hertz, we can also define the Fourier transform to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of t, e to the minus j two pi f t dt, or the inverse Fourier transform to be minus infinity to infinity, x of j omega, e to the j two pi f t df. And as we've discussed already, we know that the frequency response h of j omega is defined in terms of the impulse response h of t as h of j omega is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity h of tau e to the minus j omega tau d tau. And we can now see that the frequency response is the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Note, although in our derivation we restricted x of t to have pulse-like finite duration signals, it can be shown that the Fourier transform exists for absolutely integrable signals as well as finite energy signals. Furthermore, it exists for many power signals as well. In class activity one, find the Fourier transform of x of t equals delta of t. So our formula is x of j omega is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, delta of t e to the negative j omega t dt, and because of our sifting property, we can write this as the integral from minus infinity to t, delta of t, e to the j zero dt, which is just the integral of the impulse and the area under an impulse is one. So we know that the Fourier transform of delta of t is one. So in the time domain, we would show the impulse and in the frequency domain, we would show a one, which means that the impulse, the Fourier transform, has all frequency components. In class activity two, find the inverse Fourier transform of x of j omega equals two pi delta of omega. So we would have x of t is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, one over two pi, 2 pi delta of omega e to the j omega t d omega, which equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity delta of omega e to the j omega t d omega. Once again, using our sifting property, we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity delta of omega e to the j zero d omega, which gives us one. So we see that one has a Fourier transform of two pi delta of omega. So in the time domain, if you have one for all time, then in the frequency domain, you have an impulse at zero and the area under that impulse when you integrate over it would be two pi. So we call in-class activity one and two duals. We'll talk a little bit more about duals later, but what we've seen from now is that when you have an impulse in the time domain, it becomes a constant in the frequency domain, or if you have a constant in the time domain, then in the frequency domain, you get a scaled impulse. In-class activity three, Find the Fourier transform of x of t equals the rect of t over t. So x of j omega is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, rect of t over t, 
e to the negative j omega t dt, which equals the integral from minus t over two to t over two, because that's where the rect is defined, e to the minus j omega t dt, which equals negative e to the negative j omega t divided by j omega evaluated from negative t over two to t over two, which equals e to the negative j omega t over two minus e to the negative j omega t over two divided by j omega. Now it is very important that you get comfortable recognizing signs and sinks because you cannot leave your final answers like here, like this. What you should recognize is this looks like a sign. So I can rewrite it as two times the sine of omega t over two divided by omega. Now I eventually wanna write this as a sink because I know that the dual of a rect is a sink. So I'm now gonna multiply both terms by two, by t, and I can rewrite this as t times the sine of omega t over two divided by omega t over two because I've multiplied by t over t. And I can rewrite this as t times the sink of omega t over two pi. So this means that the Fourier transform of rect of t over capital T is the sink, T sink of omega t over two pi. So let's sketch this out and see what it looks like. So when you have a rect in the time domain with an amplitude of one defined between negative t over two and positive t over two, that becomes a sink in the frequency domain. So here we sketch out our sink function where the amplitude is t and the zero crossings are two pi over capital T, four pi over capital T, and so on, so over here, minus two pi over capital T, and minus four pi over capital T. One other thing to note about this dual relationship is that the narrower the pulse is in the time domain, the wider the spectrum will be in the frequency domain. Or conversely, the wider the pulse is in the time domain, the more narrow the, spectrum, the sink will be in the spectrum domain. In class activity four, the Fourier transform can be used to find Fourier series coefficients. We follow a procedure that is the reverse of the one used to define x of j omega. Suppose x of t is periodic, as shown below, and you want to find x of k. We will define x hat of t to be one period of x of t. So x hat of t would look like the following, which is one period of x of t. So then x hat of j omega would be equal to the Fourier transform of x hat of t, which remember is one period of x of t. So then x of k would be equal to one over t naught x hat of j k omega naught. And remember all of this follows from our derivation that x of j k omega naught was equal to t naught x of k, which was used to solve for x of j omega. So now let's start the last in-class activity for today's lecture. Find the Fourier series coefficients of y of t by using Fourier transforms, where this is a pulse train where we will assume that the amplitude is a one. So note, if Fourier transforms of y hat of t is easier to obtain, then it's, it's easier to use that to find y of k by using y hat of j omega.
So once again, y of t would, y hat of t would be one period of y of t. So y hat of t is going to be erect between negative t over four, t not over four, and t not over four with an amplitude of one. So we know that that's a rect of t over t not over two, or rect of two t over t not. So now we wanna find the Fourier transform of y hat of t. And we can use the result that we got before. So that would be t naught over two sink of omega t naught over two divided by two pi. And this is y hat of j omega. y hat of j k omega naught is equal to t naught over two sink of, we replace omega with k omega naught, so that would be k times two pi over t naught times t naught over two divided by two pi so if we simplify this, this becomes, this equals t naught over two, sink of k over two. So now for our last step, we solve for y of k. y of k equals one over t naught, y hat of j k omega naught. So we take one over t naught, times t naught over two, sink of k over two, and that simplifies to our final answer for y of k, which is one half sink of k over two. And this concludes today's lecture on Fourier transforms.